Okay, continuing with hypothesis tests about a single sample. I mean, we're very slowly working our way to where we're actually going to do one of these. Now, the method in doing it is not that hard. You could just learn some simple steps and do it, and I'll give you some steps and you can do it. But I really need you to understand what's going on here. Otherwise, the rest of the semester is going to be pretty difficult, and stats won't make any sense to you. So let's talk about this simplest case scenario. We're still working our way up to actually doing some math. This is... But it's actually not a super oversimplified thing. It's actually pretty common in practice to do this one sample mean situation. The setup for this is you have one variable, a numeric variable. You have one sample of, ob of observation from a population uh, using that variable. One sample of observations on that variable from a population. And you calculate the mean naturally. And then you have this null hypothesis that came from somewhere else. And from that null hypothesis, you figure out what the implied value of the null hypothesis mean should be, mu zero. What should the mean of the null hypothesis distribution of raw scores and therefore distribution of means be? So what population did our sample mean come from if the null hypothesis is true? So we, we're specifying this distribution of means with the null hypothesis model. We're putting mu zero, the implied mean of the null hypothesis, right in the middle there, specifying a cutoff level so we know when we should reject the null when we should not. We, we need some gold line there. And then we place our sample value in there. And if p is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. If p is less than alpha, we reject it, etc. You already saw this graphic, but it's so much fun. I'm so proud of myself. I'm just going to keep showing it. Here. There we go. So the hypothesis test procedure slightly more specific, little by little, we're getting there. You specify both hypotheses, which you know how to do. You draw and label the graph, which you're, you're getting there. You've seen pictures of graphs I've drawn and labeled in PowerPoint here, so you should do the same thing. Okay, if your, you know, your, your sampling distribution of the means looks like an upside down bowl, that's perfectly fine, or like a weird little pyramid, whatever. You draw the, you find the critical Z value now what this is, this is the Z value that you have to beat in order to reject the null hypothesis because you're going to calculate an observed Z value, right? We already saw how to do that, just a Z score, but using means instead of raw scores and in the sampling distribution of means instead of in the sampling sam or the distribution of raw scores. So it's just a Z observed, but we need to know where that Z observed should be. Now you don't need a Z critical if you calculate Z observed and then you just figure out the area beyond Z observed. You can just see if that area is less than alpha. So if alpha is 0.05, it's less than 0.05. But as we'll see, um, it gets to where the tables are pretty complicated with other things beyond Z like T scores and things. And there's not, and you're not gonna be able to find at least by hand a specific P value. So you kind of tell yourself, well, well logically you work out that the P has to be less than 0.05 or greater than 0.05 has to be less than 0.05 if your Z observed goes beyond this Z critical value. So it's good practice to start trying to find a critical Z value if you're gonna do these things by hand, which I'm gonna make you do a few times. So you find a critical Z value, an observed Z value, you draw them all on your graph so you can see actually what's going on, and then you compare your observed to your critical Z value. If the graph and your values make it clear that uh, your observed value is in that rejection region, that P is less than alpha, then you reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, you don't reject it. And then whatever you do, you state your conclusion, which should be about the population. You should go back to saying, well, we think this is what's happening in the population. So we think the population mean is actually such and such or less than this. The technical part is calculating Z, but it's not terribly difficult. Uh, the calculation of these kinds of things, these Z type, these, these test statistics, as we call them, is always the same pattern. The core of these uh, of a hypothesis test mathematically is this test statistic. And it's always just the difference between what your data says and what the null hypothesis predicts that your data should have said, expressed in standard errors. In other words, it's a z-score. It's a z-score based on your data in the distribution of the null hypothesis. Maybe this basic principle could be a little bit more concise. If you have any ideas, let me know. So we calculate the z-observed the z value for our mean, and it's always this format. You, your point estimate, which is your sample mean, minus the null expected value of the point estimate. So in this case, uh, it would be mu zero over the standard error of the distribution of all possible means according to the null hypothesis, right? So over the standard error of the mean. So it's just gonna be the mean minus mu zero over the standard error. Very easy calculation. You don't even have to do any crazy like 
weird powers or transformations. And it's, it's not very difficult. You have to do a square root in there, but you can just push that button on your calculator. So the questions to ask yourself as you're getting going is to see if you know what is the sample point estimate. The answer to that so far is going to be a mean, but later it'll be something like a difference between means or the variance among means or something like that. What is the sample point estimate? In this case, a sample mean. And we're going to compare that to the null hypothesis value. And to do that effectively, we need to know what the sampling distribution is. We need to know the mean of that distribution and the standard deviation of that distribution. The mean of that distribution is mu zero. The standard deviation of that distribution is the standard error of the mean, which you know how to calculate. It's the standard deviation of the raw scores divided by, uh, in, implied by the null hypothesis, divided by the square root of the sample size, square root of n. So this is sometimes called a one sample z-test or a single sample z-test. We're going to take the mean of a single sample and we're going to compare it to mu zero, the expected value from the null hypothesis. And that requires us to think about where we get this mu zero from. Well, we often hear people say it's specified by the researcher from theory. And that's not very satisfying. It took me a long time to work out what people were talking about with this stuff. Um, well, this is what people usually do. They take a population mean that is known or estimated from somewhere else. Now, this has to come from outside your study. You can't get this value from your study. There are important reasons for that. Also, it's usually impossible. <clears throat> this comes from outside your study. So if your sample mean is this, then you might compare it to a sample mean from all possible historical things. So if, you're, if you've got a sample of temperatures from this year, you might compare it to the known mean of temperatures for the past 100 years. If you've got you know, the weights of this species of marmots, then you might compare that weight, your, your sample mean of weights, to the known weights of like all the other species of marmots or something like that. So it can be a mean from some population, your same population or a similar population. It can be a theorized value. It can be something like uh, Einstein's theory says the speed of light should be, you know, 300,000 meters per second squared or whatever that is. 300,000 kilometers per second squared? Boy, oh, it's not squared, it's just per second. Velocity isn't squared, that's acceleration. Yeah, I should have paid more attention to physics, I, I admit this. Um, so it can be a theorized value. And so we would say if the theorized value is true, then random sampling should produce variable, you know, some variability from that population. And so the theorized value can be mu zero. It can be some common sense benchmark value. Let's look at some examples. And that benchmark value doesn't have to be a real value that came from anything except it's useful to compare against. And sometimes that's all we need. So a known population value. We could say, if we know that the ACT verbal test national mean score is 21, then we could say mu zero for our study is 21. And we have some sample, and our hypothesis is that our sample has a higher mean score than the national mean. Then mu zero would be 21, and we'd see if our sample mean was different from that. Or enough, it'll always be different. Was it enough different to reject the null hypothesis? Let's say you've got, I don't know, green energy companies and you look at the age of their CEOs and you think that the age of green energy company CEOs on average is lower than, than all Fortune 500 CEOs. And so your mean uh, of the null hypothesis value would be all Fortune 500 CEOs mean ages, which we could probably look up for a calculator or something like that. And so you do a hypothesis test to see if, um, if you could reject the, the null hypothesis that your green energy CEOs ages was the same. So you, you think maybe you're, they're younger or something like this. It can be a theorized value. So some theory that suggests a specific value, and that's it. That's your null hypothesis value. And of course, you're thinking about this. You're working through the logic of why this value is there and why you're comparing against it. Uh, sometimes people will just make a claim. So Glenn Beck has claimed repeatedly that illegal immigration is a drain on the, on the American economy, right? So the null hypothesis would be zero, that there is a zero net effect of illegal immigration. Now, realistically, you could say zero or greater, but we never do that. With null hypothesis testing, the math is set up so we have mu zero, a single point with the null with the, um, the sampling distribution, a normal distribution constructed around it. And so mu zero needs to be one number, and it's most commonly a zero or a nothing happening kind of number. So think about what this means. Somebody makes a claim that there's a value going in a particular direction. 
away from zero, so it's a negative value, well, the null hypothesis will be that the value is zero. It won't be that the value is positive or something like that, and it won't be a range. It'll be that the value is a specific number. It's zero. So in theory, we should be able to do a range of values, but we never do. Or it can be just this benchmark. So you can say, is the mean EPA for psych majors uh, greater than a B average? In which case, the thing that we're comparing against greater than is the null hypothesis value. Mu zero is GPA is three. Or is the team average faster than a one minute mile? Then the null hypothesis mean would be one minute. So you need to know all this stuff to do hypothesis tests. You need to know what the sample point estimate is. And so far, it's going to be the sample mean. What's the sampling distribution? It's going to be all possible sample means if the null hypothesis is true. So it's the sampling distribution of the means implied by the null hypothesis. What's the mean of that sampling distribution? It's going to be mu zero, as we've discussed, chosen from somewhere outside the study. And then what's the standard error? It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Well, you know how to calculate this. It's the standard error of the mean. It's the standard, sample, the standard deviation of the raw scores in the population divided by the square root of the sample size. <clears throat> so slightly more full conceptual setup. This is where we always want to get a nice little graph on our paper or our chalkboard that looks like this. The sampling distribution of the mean implied by the null hypothesis. And then right here in the middle, you've got your null hypothesis implied value. And you've got your alpha area. In this case, this is a two-tailed test shaded in. And you look up for numbers eventually and put them there. And you have a standard error, which is the standard deviation of this nice little curve here. And then you're going to plunk your sample mean there. You always want to get to a diagram that looks like this, because once you get here, it's just plugging numbers in and calculating. And that's the implied raw score distribution, which apparently I forgot to have animated first. So this pattern never changes. If the mean is in kilometers per hour of like go karts or something like that, and, it has, and there's a standard deviation of the raw score distribution, then you want to specify the sampling distribution of the means of the same sample size as your sample. And so the standard error of the mean will be the standard deviation of the raw scores divided by the square root of your sample size. You specify your alpha. You put your sample there from an n of 65, right? And you calculate your p. In this case, you, well, I don't know. Would you reject the null hypothesis? You think about it. Here's another one. Let's say it's age. Let's say the null hypothesis. You've worked out that 89 years old should be the null hypothesis, and the standard deviation of of years of ages should be 9.8 years. And you've got a sample size of 36, so you need to specify the sampling distribution of the means for sample sizes of 36. So you put that right over the top of the null hypothesis mean. You work out the standard error, the standard deviation of this sampling distribution of means, so which is the uh, standard deviation of the raw scores divided by the square root of, in this case, 36, the sample size. So my nice small standard error there. You figure out your alpha, so in this case it's a positive one-tailed test apparently, and our hypothesis was that something or other is greater than 89 years. And, oh, failed. Our sample mean was 90.2 years, which is nowhere near close enough to reject that null hypothesis. So sad. Our p would be much greater than alpha, but we would calculate p based on this, or at least say that p was greater than alpha. We don't always have to calculate p as long as we know it's whether it's either greater than or less than alpha. Here's another example with GPA, the standard deviation of the raw score is 0.97. The null hypothesis for some reason says that GPA of the population should be 2.7. You have a sample size of 127, so you imagine that sampling distribution of all possible means uh, of size 127 with a standard deviation as it turns out of 0.086. You put in your critical value and your alpha and then you plunk in your Sample mean, there we go. Did we reject the null hypothesis? Is P less than alpha? Hmm, looks like not. Another one, numbers of fish. The null hypothesis means 6.9 fish. I have no idea what I'm doing with this. I'm just putting numbers, coming up with the units. I did work things out so that the diagram could be relatively accurate. That was fun. But if the standard deviation of the raw scores is 5.9 and you have a sample size of 23, which is okay despite what the book will tell you, um, then the standard error of the mean is 
1.23. And maybe this is a negative. Maybe you're saying there will be fewer fish left in the North Atlantic or something like that. And, oh, there were fewer. 3.7 fish, my example, mean reject the null hypothesis. There are fewer fish. You don't have to calculate p necessarily to know that p will be less than alpha in this case because the mean is in that rejection region. Here's another one. Weight, 76.2 kilograms. Raw score, standard deviation is right there. Sample size of 109 in our sample. So we specify the sampling distribution of means according to the null hypothesis. So the mean is mu, the, the middle of that distribution is mu zero, just like the raw score. Uh, and the standard deviation is going to be right like this because it's the original standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size there. We've got this half of alpha here and half of alpha here because this situation is a two-tailed situation. And we should look at this for a second because this, this is where things get a little weird. You don't actually have to worry about this very much because it doesn't matter. We'll explain more as we go through the test. It doesn't matter. There's not a lot of extra complication for a two-tailed versus a one-tailed test. But conceptually, there's more complication. If you want your graph to be super accurately shaded in, then you should remember that their alpha is divided in two tails, so p is always divided in two tails too. So if your sample mean is right there, then first of all, you don't need to calculate p. You reject the null hypothesis. If the sample mean is in either tail, if it's in either rejection region, you reject the null hypothesis. If it had been way down on the left here, you know, like a mean of 25 or something, you would have rejected it also. But if you're interested in truly calculating P super accurately, and nobody is and nobody cares, um, then you have to remember that there's a mirror image of your sample mean. When you have a two-tailed test, everything is doubled. Alpha is doubled, well, it's cut in half. And then your p-value is cut in half too. So if you calculated this area, the area beyond x here, or beyond x, beyond x bar, then that area would only be half of alpha. You'd have to double it because on the other side of the distribution, the mirror image of that cutoff point from there on out to the left would be the other half of p. Sorry, it's not half of alpha, it's half of p. It doesn't matter. All that matters is I'm in the rejection region, reject the null hypothesis. P is less than alpha. And we're done with that one.